Yes, we are. We're going to read the Bible now. And we're starting with Matthew 13, 24 to 30, entitled The Parable of the Weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his, fi- in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also ap- appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did this, the weeds come from? Oh, an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Commencing again at verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, As uh, I was introduced earlier, my name is Simon and... uh, my wife Sarah and our kids, we uh, go to the 10.30 service, but occasionally we pop in here and see you and join you, and it's great to be with you this evening. Uh, interesting passage to start off uh, the year with, and I thank Rod Bailey for the sermon passage, uh, but it's certainly something that I think we can uh, get our heads around and something that we can look at. So as we come to do that, let's uh, commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a good a mighty, a holy and a just God. We thank you for forgiveness found in Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your word and for what it teaches us. As we look at it tonight, Lord, we pray that you would teach us, you would refresh us, that you would challenge us um, and that we might be open to the things that you want us to hear this evening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, I'm not quite of the generation of most of you And so I need to be honest and say I'm not really on Facebook or Instagram. And in fact, I think I have uh, one account that I follow on Facebook and that's my workplace, just so I can keep an eye on the person who's supposed to be responsible for it. Um, And now I've chosen to have no friends on Facebook because that way I don't have to be mean to anyone, just everyone. Uh, But when I want to know what's happening in the world, um, whether it be real or make-believe, Um, I take my wife's phone and I look through her Facebook account just to see what's happening in the world and where some of our friends might be up to. It's been Christmas and it's been the summer school holidays and so it's not uncommon for people to post things about what they've done at Christmas or what they've been up to in their holidays on Facebook or Instagram. Um, At key times of the year, and most of you will know this more than I do, at key times of the year, Facebook likes to remind you about what you might have done six months, 12 months, or for the last five, six, ten Christmases, um, so that you can look at how much you've aged over time. (laughs) Um, They kind of give you a snapshot of your past. The parable that we're looking at this evening gives us a snapshot into the future, a snapshot of what we can expect as God's kingdom grows a picture of what it will be like at the end of the age, at the end times. Knowing what is coming and that 
what it's going to be like if his disciples stick with him, Jesus told this parable because he wants his disciples to stick with him and he wants them to proclaim the gospel. The section that we're looking at tonight includes Jesus' teaching using parables and then a section, a couple of verses later, where Jesus gathers together his disciples and he takes them to one side and he explains the meaning of this parable to those, we're told, who have ears to hear. In many respects, this parable deals with a question that a lot of people ask. How can I trust and believe in a God where there appears to be so much evil, suffering, resistance and persecution in our world? Why, if Jesus has come and ushered in his kingdom, does he allow all this evil to continue in our world? Well, here in this parable, we see that Jesus has ordered a definite and a deliberate delay in the action that is to be taken against evil in our world. A definite and deliberate delay in the action that is to be taken against evil in our world. Now, I've been reading up a little bit on this parable over the past week, and I've read some sermons, and I've listened to some, and I've looked at some devotions, some commentaries, and some interpretations of this parable. And I want to say that some of them are actually really dangerous. We need to remember that this is a story with an overall picture. And not necessarily, absolutely every little detail has a particular meaning, other than to help us understand the bigger picture of what Jesus is trying to say. We've also got the really rich privilege of this parable, in that Jesus actually takes time to explain it to us. And so we need to allow Jesus' teaching of what he said in this parable to actually guide us as to what we see and understand to be taking place. Scripture, interpreting scripture, is really helpful. So let's delve into it a little bit more. Firstly, just a quick recap of the basic plot of the parable. The farmer or the owner or the master sows wheat in his field. Overnight, his enemy comes and sows weeds amongst the crop of wheat. The crop grows up and there are weeds among the wheat. The owner's servants notice the weeds and their first response is to question the quality of the seeds that have been planted. So they ask their master if he's sown good seed. The master replies that it is the enemy that has sown weeds and the servants are anxious. They're anxious about the problem that is before them. There are weeds amongst the crop. And so they ask their master if he wants them to pull it out. The master's response, perhaps surprising, it's the first thing I want to do when I see weeds in my garden. Don't go looking in my garden at the moment, though. Um, If you look at the crop, you would think that that might be a logical response. But the master says no. And he tells them to let both the weeds and the wheat grow up together until the harvest. Then at harvest, he will send out his reapers to collect and burn the weeds and to gather the wheat into his barn. So who's who in the story that Jesus has told? Well, Jesus' disciples, as he interprets the parable for them in verses 38 and 9, are told, the one who sowed the good seed, verse 38, is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. The field in this parable is the world. It's really important that we recognise that it's not the church here. We're told really clearly that it's the world. The good seed are the people of God's kingdom, genuine Christian people, followers and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The owner is the son of man. It's Jesus himself. The enemy is the devil, Satan, and the weeds are people who follow the evil one, or in fact, anyone who is not a follower of the Lord Jesus. And the angels are the reapers at the harvest. As we look at this parable, we can make a couple of quick observations. Firstly, there is evil in our world. 
if this is a snapshot or a picture of what it will look like as the kingdom of God grows, then we must expect that we will come across evil. Jesus is clearly indicating that evil will continue in this world until the harvest, until Christ returns and ultimately deals with it. There is going to be death. There is going to be lies. There is going to be deceit. There is going to be betrayal. There is going to be dishonesty. There is going to be crime. There is going to be broken relationships. Just flick on the evening news or read your paper or read the posts that come in Facebook and you will see that this is the reality that we live in. There is, these are part of the foothold that evil has in our world. It isn't that God has abandoned us, but that God is allowing the weeds and the wheat to grow up alongside each other and God is patiently waiting. Evil is present and evil is active in our world, just as Jesus tells us here that it will be. Secondly, when we see that Jesus allows evil and the sons of daughter and the daughters of the kingdom of God to grow up alongside each other, the enemy sneaks into the field and he plants the weeds alongside the wheat. Now, we're not entirely certain as to the plant that is referred to here in Matthew 13. However, the parable is clearly referring to a weed that looks much like wheat in its youth. What Jesus most likely is referring to is a plant called darnel or cockle. It's a noxious weed that closely resembles wheat in its youth. And it was pretty plentiful and is pretty plentiful in Israel and those surrounding areas. The difference between this weed and real wheat is really only evident when the plants grow up to maturity and the ears of the grain appear. The ears of real wheat are heavy and they droop, while the darnels stand tall and they often are taller than the wheat that they are surrounding. This means that the weeds stand taller and it's really much easier to identify them at the time of harvest and to make sure that we're pulling out the right thing and we're separating the wheat and the weed. However, it's really easy to mistake the two in their youth and to mistake wheat for weed or weed for wheat. But Jesus allows both of them to grow up, we're told. Thirdly, the church hasn't been given the task of eradicating all evil in our world. Throughout history, the church has burnt at the stake those who have claimed not to be followers of Jesus or have questioned elements of the church's teachings, whether they be good or bad. Christian nations in the world and Christian leaders, supposedly in the name of Jesus, have waged war on non-Christian nations to rid the world of evil and force people to be followers of Jesus. Yes, we should stand up for truth. Yes, we should seek to win people for Christ by telling them the good news, by telling them the good news of a crucified and risen Lord Jesus. And yes, we should be discerning and stand against evil and call it out for what it is. But to us, the task of eradicating all evil in this world, us, the task of identifying who are truly followers of Jesus Christ and sifting the wheat and the wheat, the wheat and the weed has not been given. That is the task for Christ and his harvesters, his angels at the end of the age. Jesus commands a definite and a deliberate delay so that the kingdom of God might grow up, so that we might be identified, so that the kingdom of God might grow to maturity. Who's in control? It is the enemy, Satan, that plants the weeds, but it is Jesus, the Lord, who allows it. It is Jesus who directs the harvest. He has not lost control, but he has commanded a deliberate and a definite delay in the harvest 
so that people might turn to him, so that the wheat might grow up to maturity and not be mistakenly pulled out. Christ is still sovereign in all things. So why do we experience suffering and persecution and why is there so much evil in our world? The answer is that Jesus hasn't returned yet. Jesus hasn't returned yet. We live in a period of overlap in the present evil age and the one, the age that is to come. Jesus has come and he has ushered in his kingdom, but we long for a day when it will be fully realised. But in the meantime, we still live in a world that is affected by sin. It can be a difficult place to live in the middle. But Jesus has still commanded a definite and a deliberate delay. So why does Jesus tell this parable? Why do we need to know all of this? Well, we need to have a right expectation about what it will be like until Jesus Christ returns. And we need to realise what is at stake. We need to have a right expectation about what it will be like until Christ returns. And we need to realise and fully comprehend what is actually at stake. Well, if we're to have a right expectation about the growth of the kingdom of God, we will recognise that as a church we should have a heart for the lost. We should be prayerful that many might come to Christ, that Wollongong might see significant revival, that our doors would be bursting at the seams with people hungry to know more about Jesus, that our doors and our buildings and our services will be full of people who have come to faith in Jesus, that we're looking to plant more churches and run more services and build bigger buildings to house them all. It's part of our vision statement, is it not? To know Christ and to make him known. And while we long for all to come to Christ, we can't expect that the whole world or that the whole of the Illawarra or that the whole of Wollongong will come to faith in Christ. Not that it's impossible with Christ, but it's not what he promises. Jesus' teaching here is clear. Weeds will grow up. Weeds will grow. At the same time, we should not lose heart. We know from the parable of the mustard seed that small, from small seeds, great trees can grow. While weeds will grow up amongst the wheat, there will be a harvest of wheat and it will be plentiful because God has planted the seed. People will come to Christ and his kingdom will grow. We need also to have the right assessment of Jesus. It's tempting to judge and criticise Jesus based on that which he never set out to do or to achieve. Some would say, I can't follow a Jesus that hasn't rooted out all evil in the world, that allows suffering and pain and hardship. How can he possibly be a good God? Well, I think this parable is part of the answer. To say that Jesus came away to do came to do away with all evil in the present age is to actually go against that which Jesus said would happen and what his purpose for coming the first time was. Every time someone suffers, every time there's evil evident in our world, it does indeed pain our Lord Jesus. And he will ultimately deal with all evil and injustice, but he hasn't brought about his final judgment yet that will happen when christ returns and in the meantime we need to wait and we need to be patient jesus has kindly delayed his final judgment and his second coming so that his harvest might be brought to full maturity and so that we might have the pleasure of leading people into his kingdom and seeing others and ourselves come to faith in him Jesus is incredibly merciful and he's exceptionally patient. 
And this is the age that we live in. We should be glad about the delay in Christ's return because it allows this room to be full of people who have come to Christ. And what is at stake? Well, if Jesus told this parable so that we would have the right expectations about the growth of kingdom, he also told this parable so that we would fully understand what is at stake. Verses 40 to 42. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The weeds at the time of the harvest will be pulled out and they will be identified for what they really are and they will be burned. This will be the reality for those who are not followers of the Lord Jesus at the end of the age. All who do not follow Christ will be cast out of God's presence forever and will experience the torment and the suffering of hell. Thrown into the blazing furnace and we're told there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, the picture here is not a good one for the weeds. While in the field they may have looked strong and they might have even been the tallest. They would have enjoyed the delights of the sun and the morning rain. While in this world they may have seemed to have prospered and even overcome, they might have appeared to get away with their wickedness. But those who reject Christ as their Lord and Saviour, those who are not part of God's kingdom, those who are not wheat, will be judged. Their evil will be punished and they will be thrown into hell. And eternal separation from all that is good from God. Jesus is clearly in control here. He oversees the harvest. He sends out his angels. He gives the orders. He commands the destruction. He's the final Lord and judge of all. He is the one who will finally deal with all that is evil and all who refuse God's rule. We long for a day when evil will be destroyed and nothing could be more evil than to oppose the rule of the Creator God. It's very important that we understand what is at stake here. It's the difference between eternal life and eternal condemnation. It's a, I started this evening with a snapshot idea or a picture taken at Christmas or a post that is pasted on Facebook that might come up in your account. This parable is a snapshot or a post to warn us about what is to come. It is a graphic and a horrific picture of destruction and an anguish. Now, I'm not trying to scare you But it is scary. It's something that should be taken really seriously. There is going to be a decisive day when this world will be judged. And those who are not part of the kingdom of God, those who are not the wheat, will be held accountable and there will be no second chance. There will be no court of appeal. There will be no suspended sentence they will be thrown into hell. It is endless, it is helpless, and it is hopeless. Sometimes we try to soften this warning, but we can't, and we shouldn't. It's not really a topic we bring out at at dinner parties or in polite conversation. It's kind of in the category of politics and your salary. You hear people jokingly say, If I go to hell, that's okay. At least I'll be there partying with my mates. There will be no party in hell and there will be no mates because those things have something of good in them and even those things, the good in them, is all from God. 
Australians have the it'll be right on the night mentality. You know, it won't. It won't. There will be endless regret and distress for those who do not trust in the Lord Jesus. I heard someone recently describe the gospel without hell as the cross without meaning, a world without justice. Jesus came to live and to die and to pay the penalty for those who have faith in him so that they might come into God's kingdom, so that we might rest in his barn, that we might be spared the fiery blazing furnace of hell, so that we might shine like the sun and be called the children of God. Verse 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The reality of hell helps us understand why Christ needed to come. The reality of hell helps us to understand the grace of Christ and the privilege of what we've been saved through, through Christ's righteousness in our place. This is a pretty drastic warning. It's a snapshot into the future. And so many of you might be thinking, you know, Simon doesn't preach to us very often. Um, thanks for the encouragement this evening. Well, if you're a Christian, a follower of the Lord Jesus, if you're a trusting in Christ's death and resurrection, then you have nothing to fear. For you, the promise of eternity is glorious. To shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father. But it should also be a challenge to us, though, to go out and to proclaim the gospel, to seek to draw people to Christ. Hell is real. And I don't know about you, but I don't want the people that I know and love to go there. And just as hell is real, so too is the incredible patience and mercy of the Lord Jesus. And he is deliberately delaying his return so that more may come into his kingdom and that the kingdom of God may grow to maturity. But we don't know when harvest time is. We don't know when Christ will return. So let us be faithful and diligent in making Christ known to others in 2019 and until he comes back. If you're not someone who trusts in the forgiveness that Christ offers through his death and resurrection, then this evening I urge you to reconsider the claims of Christ because the consequences of rejecting Christ are eternal and hell is real. Mark or I or maybe someone that you know that you're here with this evening would be more than happy, I'm sure, after the service to talk through that and help you explore that further. The Lord Jesus will return. We are to be patient and to wait on the Lord. We know the time until his return will not always be easy. We will come across weeds, evil in our world. It's not our job to sift out the weeds and the wheat or to uproot the weeds. Jesus will command and do this at the harvest. But we are to wait. We are to seek to make Christ known so that others may come to faith and enjoy the glorious riches of being part of God's family and his eternal kingdom. Let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, that in him we can have forgiveness, that through faith in him and through his righteousness, we can be counted as right before you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would help us to endure and stand steadfast in times of evil. May we point others to Christ 
May we speak boldly about who you are so that they may come to faith in you. Lord, we pray that you might do amazing work in our region and throughout our world, that many more may come into your kingdom. And Lord, we pray your kingdom come and that you will return soon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.